Welcome back to the post-sermon discussion at Cahutta First Baptist Church. We are so glad that you're joining us. I'm Dean, and this is Andy, and this is Brian, and we're so glad that you're here for us to talk a little bit more about the sermon from this past Sunday, which was about blind spots. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's the eighth version or the eighth installment of yes, yes. talking about blind spots, mm -hmm. and this one kind of wrapped it all up. It was. It? Mm -hmm. So... Um, the official title of the of the sermon was Our Responsibility as Believers. Right. But you had another sermon that was a little bit shorter than that. You care right. to share that with us? Yeah. So what? So what? So what? What am I supposed to do with these uh, seven parables that we looked at? Uh, and, I, and I was looking at the, what the parable was actually talking about, and I think there's a lot of people who uh, have... have watch different parts of it or come in and uh, were a part of the services. And uh, if you've ever listened to a sermon, sometimes you just get up and you go, so what? And there's a really big point uh, to our eighth parable here. It's kind of the wrap up of all of them. Yeah. Yeah. So the, here's the parable. We'll, we'll, it's very short this time. It's Matthew 13, 51 and 52. And it goes like this. Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasures things new and old. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one sentence. It is one it's sentence. It's a one sentence parable, mm -hmm. uh, but so much meaning in it as we learned this week. So yes. let's go back and those seven parables. Can you can you just in a real quick way say tell us rem, remind us what those parables were? Okay, well the uh, and, and we didn't look at the parables in their correct order because we were building up to something and we were talking about the blind spots, and again uh, blind spots are where something is obvious and right in front of you and you just miss it, and so uh, each one of these parables can be rolled up in a way where you know. It's right there in front of you. You should see it, but you just don't. And uh, the first parable that we looked at was the uh, parable of the soils. And this is a very familiar parable. Uh, but it, it's, it, we wonder sometimes why people just don't get the gospel. I mean, we can share the gospel and we can, we can uh, tell them about Jesus and how wonderful Jesus is and all that. And they just never seem to get it. I mean, no matter how hard you try. And the first parable that Jesus talks about is the parable of the soils. And there was four different types of soils. There was the hard packed ground. There was the uh, rocky soil. There was the soil with the weeds in it. And then there was the good soil. And so out of all the just, all of the uh, soils that were presented there, there was only one type that would actually produce uh, fruit, and that was the good soil. And so a lot of times uh, the first parable that we looked at is just talks about people have stuff in their life. They got things that are more important or they're just hard hearted. And some people just just don't really get Jesus and, and, and why they need him. And so uh, they pass and, you know, we keep trying to talk to him and everything, but they just don't seem to get it. So that was parable number one. And then the second parable is the, the parable of the wheat and the tares. And this is kind of it. There, there's kind of a several different ways of describing that, but it's. It really comes down to, uh, well, what the parable is about is a, a farmer who goes out and sows his field and then uh, his enemy comes and sows uh, weeds basically in his field. And what looks like a bumper crop turns out to be a, a, uh, a field full of weeds. And uh, a lot of times we find these weedy people who grow up all around us and we wonder why they're there. And and uh, why God leaves them in our lives. And that parable is describing what happens in a believer's life, but there will be this time of harvest when the two are separated and the, uh, the believer will be uh, taken away from the, the unbeliever. Uh, but really it's about, you know, why does life seem the way it is sometime? The third parable was the parable of the mustard seed. And this is Jesus describing how the kingdom's going to grow. And a mustard seed is very small, and uh, uh, when it's planted, it grows to become a, a plant that uh, is, that's quite large, the largest garden plant. Uh, and it, the text says so big that the birds come and nest in, in, the, uh, in the tree. And so he's describing how that 
while the kingdom starts off small, it's going to go really large. Uh, it went from 12 people to uh, 2 billion people. Uh, and uh, how it will grow and help the rest of the world. Along with that parable was the parable of the leaven, which that's the yeast, and that's describing uh, uh, somebody that puts uh, yeast in dough, and that yeast infiltrates every part of that dough, and it's kind of like a, a believer. Uh, a believer should uh, spread wherever they, wherever they're placed. If if you're at work, uh, what you have in your Christian faith should spread around and grow. And then the fifth and the sixth parable were my absolutely favorite parables. Uh, and this was what started the, the whole series on blind spots uh, because it was talking about the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. And uh, as I was thinking through this series to begin with, I hit those two parables and I was just really amazed at even believers, how we don't see Jesus. I mean, he, uh, Jesus is so wonderful, and he's uh, so special to have in your life. And in that parable, the person in the parable goes and sells everything that, sells everything that he has to buy that priceless treasure uh, because it's everything. And the same way with the, the pearl of great price. He goes in and uh, sells all the rest of the pearls that he has so that he can get that one. And those are all pictures of Jesus and how if we really could see him, if we could really see how he is, uh, there's nothing that would stop us from uh, from having Jesus in our life. And then the, uh, the uh, seventh parable then is the parable of the dragnet, which is what ends up happening to those people who never see Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, and what a sad, uh, the, the, the parable of the dragnet is absolutely the the saddest of all the parables because it really shows the fate of those who never see Jesus for whatever reason. And so those were the uh, the seven parables about the kingdom of God uh, and uh, how Christ's kingdom will be set up. And then the one we're looking at today is the eighth parable, which is not a parable about God's kingdom, but a parable about the disciples themselves. And so, so he asked this question in there, uh, have you understood all these things? That's how this one kind of starts out here. Mm -hmm. And you had, you mentioned that Jesus doesn't ask questions. Like, for, for example, if I ask you a question, I'm asking you because I want information. Correct. Right? But that's not why Jesus asks questions, right? That Jesus never asks questions for information purposes. Because he already knows He it. knows. Right. Yeah. right. So, so why would he ask a question then? Jesus, and in any time that uh, you see Jesus asking a question, he is always uh, asking it for the purpose of revelation. He is going to show something about himself. Uh, he is wanting to grow his relationship with you. Or very often he's revealing someone else's hypocrisy, especially like when he's dealing with the scribes and Pharisees and they get into those conversations. They ask him a trick question. Uh, he asks, turns around and asks them another question back, and it reveals where their heart really is because he already knows. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus always asks the question with the intent of revealing something about himself or helping you to understand more about what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. So you, you talked about the difficulty of not knowing what you don't know. Is there anything you don't know, Andy? Is anything at all? You're a pretty smart guy. Uh, I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, like, right. Yeah, I got this. Yeah. Yeah, and how often do we do that, right? Not very often, oh, very we, often. Yeah, yeah, we got this. We got this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it, it, Jesus is, is always trying to tell us, and this gets kind of, it's kind of what he does in this case, right? He says, do you understand these things? And then he goes on to, to say something else. Right, right. Because right. mm -hmm. cause he knows the answer. He does know the answer. He, and he doesn't need to, to ask it, but he does anyway because he wants to. He kind of likes, he wants to throw us under the bus so he can save us, I guess. It, I, exactly. Yeah, sure, that, sure, sure. <laughs> maybe that's what he's doing. I remember you talked about having this bad test and, and how that just haunted you. Yes. This, this whole idea of having this bad test. And I have to confess that I had an opposite thing happen to me one time. And I know this is 
And, and this will explain some things about me you, for both of you guys because um, I know that there's times where I frustrate everybody around me because I don't plan well, right? So, uh, so this is what happened. When I was in college, I had a speech class. And in this speech class, I was supposed to give a speech on Thursday. It was a Tuesday, Thursday class, and I was supposed to give my speech on Thursday. So um, I'm sitting in class on Tuesday, and he calls my name to give my speech. Now, I wasn't ready for a speech. I hadn't planned my speech yet. So I knew what my topic was going to be, and um, fortunately for me, it was one that I knew very well. And on my way from my seat to the front of the room, I had to formulate a way to start this speech. And I stood up in front of the class, and I gave a speech. Mm -hmm. And I got an A. And ever since then, I haven't planned anything. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, yeah, so that's that's the fault of that teacher Mm -hmm. who gave me a good grade for something that was had to be trash. I mean, it just had to be. Uh, Anyway. Uh, So, in in 52, he says... um, in that verse 52, he says, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. What does that mean? Well, the householder, uh, well, there's there's several things. The scribe there is referring to a teacher or a, a learner, someone who is uh, uh, taking in information. And it can really generally be applied. It was specifically applied to the disciples, but it can be generally applied to any believer because we're learners and and we're, we're, you know. But they had risen to a point where all of the message of Scripture and Jesus and everything were on these 12 guys. And they were going to be the ones who were going to spread the message of the gospel. And that's the reason for the question when Jesus asked in the beginning, you got this? And they said, sure, you know, hey, we got it. Uh, they had no way of knowing at this point the depth of what was actually about to take place and uh, what all it meant. Uh, They probably understood the stories as best they could, but there's no way that they could really get it. And I I would imagine that as time went on, these parables came back in their mind and go, oh, yeah, that's what that meant. And they had those aha moments. Yeah. Uh, So, You you know, you have this habit. Um, in your sermons, and I know you do it on purpose, where you go in a different direction than where we think you're going. And yes. I think in this parable in particular, probably thought we thought he was going in a different direction, right? And then boom, you know, which makes it more fun, way more. Fun. It's like riding on a roller. It's like Space Mountain. You know, you ride on a roller coaster in the dark, and you're not sure if you're going to turn right or left. Right. It's really good. Well, the, here's the thing, though. There, there is. Uh, there is the what the text actually means, and and when he tells them that they pull out the stuff, uh, things that are old and things that are new, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, many people believe, commentators believe that, that that's referring to the the Old Testament, what they're pulling out from the Old Testament, the things that they've already learned, and then the New Testament or the new things that he's given to them because the New Testament hadn't been written yet, uh, that would be, and they would have this storehouse of built up information. Uh, for the believers nowadays, uh, we should be continually taking in God's Word, and we should be continually uh, living out the Christian life, growing closer in our relationship with God. And so we should have things that we've stored up for a long time that, that are in our lives, if we've been Christians any length of time, and we should be getting new stuff all the time and for the purpose of sharing and spreading. And I think that's really the heart of what this passage is talking about is the bringing out yeah uh and 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 that's what i really kind of hung on is what are we actually bringing out yeah yeah uh this is a crazy short parable um but he kind of gives this this responsibility to the disciples um the disciples were the main people who are going to carry this message right right and so Jesus has made it clear that we are now those people that he was talking to then. Right. Right. So um, make no mistake, we are the householder. Right. At this point. And um, we should be having this. If we've stored up enough and if we're gathering in new, we have to get rid of stuff. Right. Right. We're overflowing. Right. So as we overflow, we can't help 
but share with people around us. Well, and, th- and that's the thing. Uh, and and the, the story I brought up was when Jody and I first got married and how uh, when you first get married, most folks don't have anything. And that's where kind of where we were. We, we were newlyweds. We were happy to be uh, married, but we didn't have nothing. And so uh, little by little, our families started giving us out of their abundance. It wasn't like they were giving us stuff that they needed themselves. They were simply giving out of our abundance. And we filled up our apartment with uh, everybody else's stuff. Yeah. And so it was really great because they were, they were in essence, householders or, uh, that were pulling out of their storehouse things that were old to give to us. Uh, what's funny, and I didn't get to actually get to it, most of the the furniture and stuff that we got, we actually ended up giving it to other people. Huh. Uh, which, uh, having thought about it later, you know that really is what that's about. You know, you you were given something, you you, you have it, you use it for a while, and then you then you give it away. Yeah. And so, uh, and I think that's the way it is with God's word. Uh, we hear something, we hear a message, and so many people take for granted when they're sitting listening to someone speak or they're reading their their bible but that it's really the words of god and god really give us those his words for us to take apply it to our hearts to use it and then give it away uh and, and give it away liberally as often as we can and i think it it really gets to a some people get to a bad place where they just want to store up stuff but they just don't ever want to give it out yeah, yeah. But the Bible is pretty clear about how we should be sharing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, what you're saying, what this reminds me of, it, it almost it reminds me of discipleship. It, it is. Me, I mean, it's uh, it's this, you know, at some point someone gave to you, mm-hmm. and you took that good and used it, and then you passed it along. And, you know, from generation to generation, that's how, you know, discipleship's taking place in the church, and we see it. But, and I don't know, I wanted to share this story. I don't know if this is the right time to do yeah. it. But this, this, uh, this week I, I heard this on the, on the radio. And it, it kind of reminds me, when you're talking about the bring something in and then you're giving it away, there was a story told on, um, on Moody about John MacArthur. And he had attended this Bible conference. Now, he wasn't there to speak or preach. He, he had just kind of dropped in, right? He just wanted to come and, uh, and, and sit and listen. The, uh, the person that was leading the conference, um, he handed out these styrofoam cups. Have you heard of this before? Okay. I, think, I think I have, yeah. but go ahead. Anyway, they hand out these styrofoam cups, and, and it's all these pastors, right, that's, that's attending this Bible conference. Most of them are pastors. And, and they say, okay, um, we want you to take this cup and, and some scissors. And I think there was thousands of people there. And, they, and these little scissors. And they said, we want you to carve this cup or cut this cup in a way that uh, resembles your relationship with God. You know, so kind of interesting mm-hmm. topic. And, and John MacArthur tells a story, and he said this whole time, he's sitting there and he's looking around at all these other pastors, and they're, they're cutting away and they're carving and they're doing this with their cup and, and they're making all these shapes and this, that, and the other. And he's sitting there and he's just kind of like scratching his head and just oblivious to all. I have no idea what to do with my cup. And uh, so <clears throat> the end of the time comes, and the and, uh, guy gets back up on the stage, and he goes, uh, okay, it's time for us to all share. And uh, he said, you know, I just happened to notice John MacArthur's here, and I'm going to ask John MacArthur to come up to the stage and show us what he has done with his cup. He had done nothing with his cup. Mm-hmm. And he couldn't think of anything to do with it, you know. He's, he was just uh, trying to figure it out, so he gets up there, and, as, and he gets up, and he's like, you know, he said, uh, you asked us to do this, but honestly, I couldn't think of anything to do with my cup. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he, he started sharing for a minute, and he said, then it was just like God spoke to him. And uh, he said, you know what? He said, this is what my relationship with God has to be like. And he took the scissors, and he poked a hole in the bottom of the cup. And then he held it up, and he said, this is what our relationship has to be when it comes to God. He said, our cup should be absolutely 100% full of the Spirit of God. 
that's where we, our options are. But that hole in the bottom of that cup is there so that it can pour out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I just thought, man, what a powerful story. And I know that it wasn't necessarily something he was prepared to do, but it, it just illustrates to me and I think to others how we have to, when God gives us something, whether it be some kind of, uh, you know, truth from Scripture, whatever it is, and we try to live that out in our life. But it's our responsibility to pass that along to others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, I really enjoyed that story. Yeah. That's Deuteronomy twenty eight twelve says this, says the Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. God tells us that if we're sharing, mm-hmm. and if we've got that hole in the bottom of our cup, and if we've got those storehouses that are overflowing and we can't help but to share things. That but the point of that passage was here it is that Jesus is telling the disciples to, to have that storehouse, that they are they are owners, they are possessors of a home now, and they're going to pull out of that th- old, uh, things old and things new. Uh, but the reality is God has a storehouse of blessing that he's waiting to pour out on us yeah. and that he will pour out on us. And the thing about the cup is the more that comes out the bottom, the more will go in the top. And that's the way God is. The more that you give out, the more you spread God's word, the more you share you what you have the more you'll have to give. And the question is then, well, I know the spiritual truths. I know that, you know, all the stuff, what else could there be? There can be so much more because God can give you a deeper, fuller relationship with him so that his mercy and grace just oozes out of everything that you do. And it changes your person. Uh, and, and we've talked over these last few weeks about being the witness and being and sharing and all that, the gospel. But when, when your cup is full, it's not something that you have to work for. It's just something that happens because of the overflow of blessing that's already in your life. Yeah, yeah. You know, if there's one thing that I've learned in my Christian walk is, you know, and we know that God could open up the heavens and he could pour out a blessing and he could do it directly and we could see that it come directly from God. But he chooses to use his believers, mm-hmm. his children. And that has been proven over and over me how other believers would respond to the spirit of God, see a need and fill that need. Mm-hmm. That, that's how God chooses to bless people. It comes through his children. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and, and one of the things that it says here, the last few words of that verse is to bless all the work of your hands. It, it takes action. Mm-hmm. It takes some action in order to to get those blessings. And that action may be as simple as opening up your Bible and reading it to get some of that, but it, there's, a, there's a lot of meeting needs. And we just got through packing bags for some kids who um, don't, don't aren't as well off as we are. We're sharing, mm-hmm. we're sharing out of our storehouse. We are. And that's literally what that's, you're, you're doing there. That's exactly but, right. But there are so many different little areas where this applies and it, and it could be just uh, uh, giving some money at the gas station for somebody who's pumping gas that's in need. I mean, it, and it can be in little things where you take, and you, you may say, well, I'm not rich and I don't have an abundant. Well, you do because there are people who are far uh, in far worse shape than you are. And it doesn't take much given in the name of Jesus that can mean so much. And, and, this is specifically speaking about, uh, you know, uh, a word of scripture and a, a spiritual truth or something like that. But there's any number of ways to share Jesus in a real and personal way with other people so that they realize that uh, that it's a blessing from God. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it don't always have to be just some kind of material, you know, thing that you're giving away or helping in need. It's a, it's a word of encouragement. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, it's some kind of spiritual truth that maybe that God has revealed to you and you're sharing it with somebody else that may be really hurting or struggling in a particular you know situation or something so you know, it can be obedient to, to the spirit mm-hmm. yep we hope you've enjoyed uh this has been a great discussion over this subject and it's amazing how much you can get out of one sentence 
Yes, it that, really that, that's, is. that's the way God's word is. But that's, yeah, that's exactly right. Couldn't have said it better myself. So again, we hope you've enjoyed us. Come back and join us next week when we get into something else. There's no telling what we'll talk about next week. I mean, Actually, there is. There is going to be a blind spot part nine. Part nine there, blind spot. Here it comes. It, we're going to do one more. Beep, beep. <laughs>